So we are, we are at 9 o'clock, so good morning everybody. I'm very happy to welcome all of you here today to the Big Tech Day 22. So it's really great to see on-site participants and we also have a number of remote uh, participants this time. And um, the Big Tech Day, as you know, so I will start with a few general information. So this is a, a one-day conference which is organized by TNG once a year. And we are very happy that also this year we, uh, there are uh, a number of excellent speakers today and with their talks they will cover very exciting topics so from exciting science topics but also topics from uh, various other uh, fields like I of course IT and also other disciplines like um, awesome achievements in sports and also in art so um, with all these uh, different interesting topics, uh, you might have noticed that uh, there are also a lot of parallel tracks and uh, what I wanted to point out is that with all these different tracks you might miss some of the talks which are very interesting, so there is good news, so as the talks are recorded uh, they will be available later, so in case the speakers agree, they will be uh, available on the Big Tech Day webpage uh, after some weeks probably and there you, ca you have the chance uh, to visit or to watch all, all these talks. Um, one information for the remote uh, participants, um, if you have questions, uh, you can type them in our Slack channel and we will collect them and consider them in our um, question session at the end of the talk. So the Slack channel can also be used uh, for further communication afterwards, in case you're interested. Then for the on-site participants, um, it would be nice if you ensure that all the smartphones or other devices are in the silent mode. And can all enjoy the talks. Um, so, so much about the, the general information. So, we will directly today start uh, with, a, with a highlight. So, a highlight of research. It's about imaging black holes, something yeah, which appears to be impossible on first sight. Uh, I'm sure you all have heard of it through the news because it was, uh, this breakthrough was announced in, in media all over the world recently. And we are very happy that today we can welcome an expert on the field um, who played an essential role in, in, make, in, making, sorry, in making these um, these images possible. So our speaker of today is Anton Zensus, uh, who is an astrophysicist working as, as a director at the Max Planck, and Planck Institute of Radio Astronomy in, in Bonn. And additionally to that, as a founding chair of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. Um, he has also the responsibility for, for the whole collaboration. So the Event Horizon Telescope, this is the instrument uh, how, with which these phenomenal pictures have been, have been obtained. And a few words about uh, Anton Zensus. So he, he started his uh, outstanding career in Germany where he uh, studied uh, physics and astronomy and did his PhD. I think the stations were Cologne, uh, Münster and Bonn. After that, um, Anton Zensus uh, continued his research in the USA where for, for several years, so at first at Caltech, so the California Institute of Technology, and after that at NRAO, which is the National uh, Radio Astronomy Observatory. And after, after that, after these years in the USA, he returned to Germany, and since then he is the director at the Max Planck Institute in Bonn. So and as a side note, I can point out that this uh, here that I once also worked, had the pleasure to work in his group there at the time before I joined TNG. And uh, a few words to his, to his research. So the research is focused on, on studying galaxies in the universe with, with radio astronomy and there together with his team, he's a key player in really developing the techniques for observing these objects with the highest possible um, image resolution and sensitivity. And going to the extremes, he then initiated the Event Horizon Telescope, um, which there will be, so the great success of that is these images which we will see here today. So let us give a warm welcome to Anton Zensus. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for coming. I know you had a choice, and I'm curious as to what made you come to this talk versus the 
really exquisite selection of other opportunities you had. I hope at the end of this half hour or so you'll say it was worth your while. I picked a provocative title for my talk, Making the Invisible Visible. We didn't make the invisible visible, but something very close to it. You perhaps have heard that when we talk about black holes, these are very strange objects that we see only in the universe, in stars and actually in galaxies. Uh, anything that comes near these fantastic things gets sucked up. No matter, but also no light can escape. In that sense, everything that is near this or too near, that gets too near this, uh, becomes invisible. And uh, in my f uh, case, uh, decades ago, I started working on these objects, as Moritz said, on galaxies in the universe. And a number of years ago, uh, a group of scientists around the world uh, put together what I'll explain to you, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. We worked, and in 2017, 2017, we directed our telescope, our Event Horizon Telescope, uh, in the direction of uh, a distant galaxy, Messier 87, and our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And the story I'll tell you today will be about, in the end, how we made the supermassive black hole in our Milky Way visible. Perhaps you've seen these images. This one we just showed a few weeks ago in a press conference, uh, in press conferences around the world. It is the image that we made of the center of our own galaxy. Most of you will know what I'm talking about, but for those who don't, we have our Earth in the solar system. We have the sun as the central star. Uh, we have a number of planets. The, the solar system is only one star and its planet system of billions in our galaxy the Milky Way. And in the universe, there are billions of such galaxies, um, undescribably many of such galaxies that make up the whole universe as we know it from observing it with the greatest telescopes we have available today. This, and next to it, the, gal the image that we showed three years ago of, of a very distant galaxy. These two images, first of all, don't look particularly impressive. Uh, they are char characterized by these bright rings with some structure in them and this dark region in the middle. It's this dark region in the middle that contains the invisible. It's the shadow, we say, of the black hole. It is actually the shadow that uh, occurs when you have light uh, from a light source. In this case, we, leave, it's a, we believe it's a swirling uh, disk of uh, very hot gas moving at relativistic speeds, that moving at speeds almost the speed of light around this central mass. And uh, gravity, pure gravity, will distort the light from this and will create an image like this. That's the notion. You'll follow me. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to, to that. And in these two cases, we have two objects that are vastly different. On the right, our, the center of our galaxy is uh, 26,000 light years away from us. The light takes 26 or 27,000 years to get to us. In the case of um, the, in the other case, right next to it, seemingly very similar, the light comes from a galaxy 55 million light years away. An enormously huge object of mass of stars and gas uh, in the universe that is one of the largest galaxies that we have studied uh, over time. Uh, Messier 87, it's called. It, is, it happens to be so large that seen at this huge distance compared to our own center of the galaxy, these images turn out, these regions turn out to be comparable. And what we... What we actually see here for dimensions is something of the size of our solar system. Uh, the sun and the planets. Here on the left side for M87, you see uh, roughly from the center the distance of Pluto and Voyager 1, that satellite that 50 years ago was sent out into outer space. And the central black hole mass that I'm talking about, a mass not of one sun, like in the case of, uh, of our solar system, but of four million solar masses, is concentrated into the dimensions of a solar system. In the case of, let's see, in the case of M87, it is even more. We have, we think, we have six billion solar masses concentrated in this central region. Imagine the region that we know as the size of the system of our sun. 
this thing doesn't work anymore, so I'll go like this. It's, um, so I showed you these images, and I will at the end tell you why they matter, but I really want to tell you a story, a story that starts 100 years ago. 100 years ago, just after World War I, um, Albert Einstein had published a strange new theory of gravity. Thank you. And um, most people didn't know about that. They had other matters on their minds. But the scientific community, and this is one member of them, Arthur Eddington, Sir Arthur Eddington, a very famous, became a very famous astrophysicist, was excited by the work that, like many others, had, that Einstein had uh, done. And Einstein had made some predictions. So Arthur Eddington started a, a pioneering expedition, something akin to the expeditions that you read about, uh, that you hear about at this conference, that you read about in the papers when we think about new breakthroughs, new scientific results. These people took the best available telescopes at the time to measure precise positions on the sky, and they observed the sun. Actually, at two sides, he went to Brazil, another team went to Africa, and they observed with this uh, seemingly mundane equipment the stars located near the sun at the time of an occultation by the moon. And they had measured these, the positions of these stars previously, before that, uh, that um, eclipse. And Einstein's theory predicted that when you look at a star, at a distant star, but near the sun in front of you, that the light from that star will be distorted. And these experiments confirmed in 1919, or shortly thereafter, that indeed the light from a distant star, where it says real, actually is deflected, is changed, the path of the light to us is changed by the sheer mass of the sun, or by the effect of the mass of the sun on the light. And it appears apparently at a different position on the sky. Um, so, 100 years ago was the first time that uh, scientists could confirm this exciting new theory. Uh, Einstein became, not only of this, but also because of this, a pop star in science. This was a media event, um, like not, not many before and, and not so many afterwards. It was seen as really a, a wonder boy, a pop star, uh, out of the world of science into the popular world. The New York Times and many other journals, uh, many other newspapers, however, uh, were absolutely sure none of this either affected us in the world and none of this had really any relevance for the man on the street and the woman, people on the street. Um, they simply couldn't expect, like, they weren't able to fathom what this basic research that uh, Einstein had done, this theory of gravity, actually might have to do with us. Today we know that without the understanding of uh, the effects of relativity on the signals from the satellites and the global positioning system and similar setups, we wouldn't be able to accurately predict where we are. If, you had, if your GPS didn't, wouldn't have the corrections uh, built in, that are caused by the effects of relativity, by the effects of gravity in the solar system, you probably wouldn't have found the Kohle Bunker this morning, but would have ended up somewhere in the Englische Garten. Um, so, the message I have here is uh, seemingly irrelevant. Basic research is not only exciting for scientists, but in the long run will be the fundamental underpinning for technological de developments in areas that perhaps we wouldn't expect. Also a hundred years ago, at the same time, not really related very much, um, famous astronomer Curtis Heber used his, uh, again, uh, seemingly antique telescope to make one of the best observations of the night sky. He was interested uh, in studying something that as astronomers before him had found uh, already. When they put their sensitive telescopes to the sky, they found not just stars, if you look at the sky at night, you will only see stars, some planets, and maybe the SpaceX satellite constellations, if you're lucky or unlucky, depending how you see it. With fancy telescopes, they could see stars, but they could also see milky objects uh, like this, diffuse, fuzzy things. And in this particular case, at one point of the sky, he describes that he saw a curious object, a milky structure, with a very focused ray beam coming out of it, a curious straight ray. Uh, uh, connected to the center by a thin line of matter. Uh, he had no idea that this 
was going to be the beginning of the research that I'm, uh, that I'm doing, the, the astrophysics of galactic nuclei, of the central objects in distant galaxies, and the enormously powerful jets of matter and gas that emanate from these central structures. The discussion 100 years ago actually was, well, these are probably some kind of strange planetary stellar systems uh, around us. There was actually, 100 years ago, not yet a notion of a universe. This image here was published a few days ago. It's the latest, it is the first image of the James Webb Space Telescope. It is the deepest look into the universe. It is generations beyond what Hebert did with his work. And what we see in this picture um, is uh, lots and lots of seemingly stellar systems. All of these are galaxies. Galaxies like M87 and like our Milky Way. Um, in fact, this is a if you, if you imagine, you look at the sky and you want to see this patch, uh, this patch uh, on the sky, it is only the size, seemingly, of a grain of sand held at arm's length. That's the angle on the sky that this very image is actually looking at. The light that is uh, seen here was emitted some four and a half billion years ago and uh, took all this time to come to us and was detected in this truly astonishing image. That's our modern view of the universe, and Heber was right in his suspicion. We look, when we look out with sensitive uh, uh, telescopes, at galaxies in the universe. And um, just briefly, I don't want to go too far into all these areas of uh, astrophysics. We know, or what we know about our universe hinges, about, hinges around the notion that we have an expanding universe uh, that uh, originated from what is called the Big Bang, Astrophysicists like to use beautiful words like Big Bang and black holes to get, capture the imagination, first of students and then the public. Uh, the Big Bang, almost 14 billion years ago, happened, and uh, some 400, 500 million years after the beginning, the first gaseous clouds, stars, and galaxies eventually became, uh, began to form. And so, it took 50 years after Einstein uh, published his theory, until after uh, the first confirmations of the predictions were made, it took 50 years for astrophysicists, Stephen Hawking, for example, is one of them who was, uh, became quite famous later on, but several others before astrophysicists realized that gravity, the forces of gravity, might be the only plausible effect to explain the enormous energies that in the 60s and 70s of last century with new telescopes people saw coming from very distant objects. The distant galaxies, uh, some of them, were so bright, so luminous, they emitted so much energy that no process on Earth, no electromagnetic radiation, could easily explain what would happen there. And that was the time when astrophysicist theorists began to turn the attention towards the possibility that black holes, something that was a mathematical consequence out of the uh, work of Einstein, might actually exist in universe, and that effects related to black holes when they were very large would actually possibly dominate the structures of the galaxies we see. Um, there's not so much to say here about the black hole. It's a very condensed matter. Uh, condensed, it, it hap can happen when a star, after its normal life, like the sun, collapses into a very dense object of only a few hundred meters, uh, kilo uh, uh, kilometers, depending on the size, uh, uh, size condensed so much that, uh, as I said earlier, the gravitational attraction for everything around it is so large that everything gets sucked up. These objects are described by mathematical equations. Uh, they are hard to penetrate. If you do penetrate and you get, uh, if you do get into the uh, central part, which we, uh, which we describe as the inside the event horizon, the horizon beyond which nothing can escape, then you would probably not have a very long time to live and therefore could not really tell anyone outside what, uh, what you saw. The fundamental point about this object is nothing gets in, so we actually cannot get information, scientific information, astronomical information about these. So we have a very big central mass, we have an event horizon, and we have the notion that all the mass is actually not evenly distributed in this, but concentrated in a central point, the singularity. A lot of aspects that are really uh, far from, uh, from access to normal understanding, normal visualization. But theory says you can predict what you'd see if you put light near 
this object. Today we believe that most galaxies, like, uh, like you saw on the Webb telescope, have in their centers supermassive black holes, black holes that have masses of millions to billions that of the Sun, and that uh, they are surrounded, as I said earlier, by these uh, disks of, of accreting material, more or less flat disks oriented at a particular um, angle to our line of sight, if you like, and the black hole is determined primarily and only by its mass and by its rotation and orientation properties. So, most astrophysicists, and recently, in, it's not, say in the last 20 years, agree such ma uh, objects like Messier 87 contain a supermassive black hole, but actually, the, this distant galaxy, far away, much, much larger, is not so different from our own, own Milky Way. Galaxies uh, in the universe, such as our own, we see it as a, stri as a stripe on the sky, actually are structures with uh, oftentimes showing uh, these um, spiraling um, region spiral structures at larger distance, sometimes, however, only showing big bulges of stellar light. In this case, we have this emanating jet that you saw earlier. Um, but also the Milky Way is assumed to be very similar, and uh, it was soon or early predicted that in our own galaxy, not so far away, we would also find such a supermassive black hole. And the work of Nobel Prize winning scientists Andrea Ges and Reinhard Genzel, Reinhard Genzel who works not a few kilometers away from here in Garching, and their teams showed that indeed in our own galaxy you can observe stars, stars like the Sun, very close to the center, and these stars move on what we know as Keplerian. I know many of you are physicists, you will know what Keplerian motions are. For, for those who aren't, the stars move on, on, on tracks, on orbits that can be calculated and that can be derived uh, from that, from these orbits, uh, we can, it is possible to derive the central mass that must be sitting there controlling or influencing the motion of these stars. And the prediction of Gensel and, and Gess and others was that there must be something sitting in our galaxy that is four million times the mass of the Sun. It is invisible. One can't see it, but can only see the effects it has on the stellar motions around. Uh, that got them the 2020 Nobel Prize. And um, I'll skip this. This shows what they. Th this actually shows the, the beauty of what they do. They they observe stars that move around, and they can measure the effects of the mass on the not only the, the, the first order, but they can also measure when the star gets very close, relatively close to the central object, the effects of relativity. And once again they now confirmed the prediction of Einstein's theory to incredible precision. They also measured to incredible precision the mass uh, to a 1% precision. Imagine something so far away you can put on a scale and measure fairly precisely how much it is. This is astonishing work. Now, how, how do we come into this game? Um, I said they, they measure the stars, but they couldn't see the central region. Can you make what you see, what you might expect to have around a black hole visible. This question was uh, a center of both theoretical work and astronomical experimental work. And this image that you see here was actually made by French astrophysicist Jean-Pierre Luminet, who I met only a few years ago. It was done at a time when there was no internet, there was no instant communication uh, of scientists about everything they did, everything they had seen. Pictures like the one of the web didn't spread out viral in, in, in minutes and, and hours. Uh, scientists, theor theorists were working by themselves, uh, experimentalists were doing their thing. Luminet calculated on, on uh, early computers, uh, based on the relativistic equations, what the light from the source around the galaxy might actually look like when it is affected by the gravity of the central mass. Gravity will do strange things. It will actually... Um, it's so strong, it will act on the photons, on the light from the, in this case, uh, optical and... and um, uh, synchrotron radiation, non-thermal radiation, it will deflect, it will change the path, as you had seen at the beginning in, in the case of the Sun. And so you will have not the image, or you will see, if you take a look at this, if you can make an image, not this 
disk, this rotate, uh, rotation, this accretion disk, as we call it, disk from accreting, um, contracting matter. But you will see an image that is a gravitationally lensed image, lensed by the effect of this uh, black hole, which operates as a gravitational lens. In other words, we will see like in a kaleidoscope that you sometimes look and you see distortions of a simple structure. You see a distorted image of the uh, light source of the uh, accretion disk around the black hole. You still don't see the black hole, but you see the effects from the round. And what Lumine and others could easily compute is that because you have a rotating disk and it's rotating at speeds, almost the speed of light, very fast anyway, you have a characteristic signature, the so-called Doppler effect, that we know also from audio, and the Doppler effect will actually give you an asymmetric image, a bright image where the red, that uh, is attributed to the uh, bright part, that's attributed to light that is coming in front of us and distorted, and darker sides where the light is going away from us and is correspondingly dim, dim uh, 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 correspondingly dimmer by the effect of uh, by the Doppler effect. We see. Um, not the gas evenly distributed in front of the disk, what we see actually gas light that after the, uh, the photons have orbited the black hole uh, one or two or more times, that comes actually from the backside of this object. They had computers, he had a computer, but he didn't have plotting software, so this was done with India Inc. by a scientist who was trained as a classical painter as well. A few years later, Kip Thorne, Nobel Prize winning uh, gravitational wave physicists worked with Hollywood and predicted or, or computed the liking of this uh, gargantuan um, black hole system uh, that the heroes in that movie actually look at. And the, the interesting uh, thing here is that, once again, theoretical predictions could give a very precise prediction, uh, work could give a very precise prediction of what you would actually see um, in a simplified case. So our goal, in a way, our target became to actually not make a calculation, but to make a measurement. And that takes the story now into uh, to the beginning of my own career 40 years ago, not different, much different from what Moritz did. I work with the 100-meter radio telescope in the Eiffel in Effelsberg. That's near Bonn, 40 kilometers from Bonn. It is a telescope that was finished, completed, bef uh, shortly before I started. And it's the biggest, one of the biggest telescopes on the planet for a particular kind of radiation. Just like your satellite antenna on your rooftop, this is a radio antenna. It's a huge collecting bucket. It collects weak radiation from space, from planets, but yes, also from galaxies, also from the center of our galaxy. It is so big because the bigger the telescope, all telescopes astronomers have need to be bigger and bigger and bigger because the bigger they are, the finer the detail is that we can measure. And so this is roughly the limit of what one can do, construct with steel and um, uh, in, in, a, in, in a reasonable, at a reasonable price cost. This was done, uh, this weighs three and a half thousand tons. It cost 30 million Deutsche Mark at the time and it can point with high precision at any point in the sky. The precision, uh, we talked about the grain of sand earlier, this, huge as it is, can only see a bit of detail on the sun. So if you look at the size of the sun, typical size of the sun or the moon, about half a degree, telescopes as large as this have a resolution, an angular resolution, a precision of detail that they can find that is only about the size, uh, they can do a few pixels across the the uh, disk of the sun, but nothing like the grain of sand looking in the universe uh, type of uh, thing. To, to do this in the radio, we need to build even bigger telescopes. And building these bigger telescopes is, the, well, we, we can go to different wavelengths. We can go into high mountains. That's, that's what we do with our second telescope in Chile that I have on this next picture here. So I'll inject that. Um, the Eiffel has a lot of rain. We go today onto the highest mountains we can get. This is at 5,000 meters altitude, and we build the telescopes with even better surface precision. But this is only 14 meters large, whereas uh, comfort, uh, compared to the 100 meters of the Effelsberg telescope. You won't get these telescopes powerful enough to make these images we want to make. And we use a trick. We actually 
use many telescopes distributed around the world for a technique that we call radio interferometry. Um, physicists have studied various types of uh, interferometry in, in uh, lab situations and, and systems, so you're familiar with that. We do, in essence, connect, uh, point different telescopes on the globe, on the Earth, at these radio sources at the same time. We record their data, um, the, the digitized uh, signals uh, from these objects, and we combine these signals after the fact in a computer. And so, um, akin to, to GPS, where we, from measuring the positions of satellites on the sky, can derive where we are on Earth, we turn this around and we measure from very precise, uh, we know where we are on Earth, we, our telescopes are on Earth, and we can measure uh, finer detail, much finer detail than a single telescope. Uh, actually, we can make images uh, on a celestial source, like a galaxy. I promised I would tell you how we made this image, uh, how we made these images, and I will just say that as I, as I just pointed out, we'll, we measure these, these data that come from the celestial source, from the galaxy. We digitize them, we record them, we transport them on data links to a central, for many of you, not so impressive supercomputer, but a quite powerful machine that correlates these data, combines them after playing them back, and out of the combined data, we extract in a process that we refer to as image processing, image reconstructing, we extract the structure of the uh, object that we have been looking at. That's in, in, in the basic uh, sequence, the, the steps we have to do. Take the data, record them, correlate them, and make an image out of them. We bring today telescopes from around the world, frequently together in such networks. Um, actually, the world is also limited, and sometimes we find that even combining these telescopes gives us um, very, very detailed images, um, actually it's this one, detailed images of the central region, we get a precision, a resolution that's 10,000 times as good as what you saw in the beginning from the best infrared telescopes, the, the web telescope. We can achieve the resolution that is in fact needed to look into the uh, surroundings of the black hole structures. Um, sometimes, even the Earth isn't big enough, and so we have dabbled for many years, I've dabbled for many years with using satellite antennas for this same technique. Imagine this, we use a satellite up to the distance of the moon, connected with the Effelsberg telescope that you saw earlier, and we reconstruct out of that images, we actually build a virtual telescope the size of the Earth-Moon system. Um, I'm still astonished myself each time this actually works because uh, a number of things have to come together, a number of things have to work well. This involves not just data processing, this also involves precision timing. The signals from these different telescopes have to be aligned to a precision of fractions of a second. The positions of the telescopes have to be known to, a high to centimeters. This is a satellite moving around the Earth at very high speed and we need to predict from orbit uh, reconstruction where it is so we can make these images. And a number of other uh, measurement aspects that make this a very challenging thing and, as I said, astonishing when it actually does work. Um, so this is the technique we had and we managed in 2015 to start put together what we know as the, what we now call the Event Horizon Telescope, a set of only eight antennas at the time that, however, were particularly suitable for the task at hand. These telescopes can operate at millimeter wavelengths. I said earlier what counts is the size of the telescope for the resolution. What actually also counts is the observing wavelength. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, if, if you like, the better the detail that you can get. So you want to get um, large apertures, large telescopes, and you also want to work at a high, at, at a short wavelength. And so this is the telescope on Chatnan Tor in Chile that I mentioned that comes into play and a number similar things. The best antennas on the globe that we could get, there are not so many, at working at a wavelength of only one millimeter. Uh, one point three millimeter is the wavelength. If you, you can hardly put your fingers precisely far enough for the wavelength that we need to detect. The precision of the telescopes to measure a 1.3 millimeter wavelength has to be of the order of a tenth of that. So we use telescopes such as um, these here that have 
enormous surface precision. The next challenge, we need to build a telescope that over time with weather impacts actually keeps its uh, surface accuracy so you can detect and amplify the signals. These eight telescopes were uh, placed, around the, uh, are placed around the globe. In, uh, we have some in, in, in Europe, in Chile. We used telescopes at the, uh, a telescope at the South Pole and we used in particular this. This is now 15 years ago new thing, the game changer that we had. The biggest telescope on Earth, which is actually not one telescope like Effetsburg, it's a collection of 64 antennas, um, 12 meters in diameter, on this Chatnan Tor plane. The ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, as it's called, is a superb instrument for measuring millimeter wavelength uh, radiation from celestial objects. It's this telescope, when we knew this would become available, when we understood how we could prepare this thing for our measurements that we knew we would have the resolution but also, also the sensitivity to make the images uh, we wanted to get at. Using this, which is, uh, using this telescope, which is, a, uh, which is uh, controlled, say, by a global collaboration between Europe and uh, the United States and Asia, Japan in particular, uh, to use this, you had to get everybody in the world uh, working with these things or belonging to their communities together. And I like to describe what we had to do oftentimes with uh, fierce discussions in the Security Council, where uh, scientists, such as yourself, somebody said yes, last night, it's so great to work with scientists because they're always so nice to each other. Well, my experience is that sci scientists maybe are nice, but in particular, they, they, you bring hundreds of people, in our case, by now about 400 or so people together, you have 400 opinions about how a measurement is done right and especially how a measurement is interpreted with the right theory. So we had to come together uh, to be able to make these observations and then we had to stay together to uh, analyze what we got. Challenges, just a few, because this is a tech conference. Uh, our challenge is data transport. We uh, have a 16 gigabit, gigabyte per second line, roughly. Uh, this is the line. These telescopes are in remote places. Um, internet is usually not, I mean, it's increasingly available, but uh, at this time, data transport for us means recording on magnetic disks. These are the disk packs we use, we use of, uh, for, for in, a, in an observation of a few hours to a few days where we bring together a few petabyte of data that have to come together. Um, that have to actually stay on the disk. My uh, computer backup disk just burned up a week ago and my data are gone. Uh, these are disks where data is taken at 5,000 meters altitude in pressure controlled chambers for the disk. And nonetheless, we still have the problem of bringing these disks back to ground uh, uh, level and to, to normal temperatures and make them still work. So a uh, challenge is handling, storing, keeping and bringing back the data. The correlation, our, uh, we, have a, we operate a, uh, a data center in Bonn where we play back the data and, and bring them together. But in astronomy, for most, the, the initial challenge is always the weather conditions. And so we observe with telescopes around the world at the same time, and sometimes even on the driest side on Earth, in the Atacama Desert, you have weather like this. We were lucky in 2017, we didn't have weather like this. We had actually reasonable weather conditions in these eight locations. And we uh, did a successful observation of these two objects, actually. And this is uh, what we did. Imagine these eight telescopes on the planet, and I say this is a virtual telescope. Well, they are hardly a full virtual telescope. If you think of a piano, this may be like a piano with the, of all its keys, only a few left. And so we are trying from measurements with an incomplete telescope, not a piano, to reconstruct a complete piece of music. I spoke last night to uh, one of our colleagues who will speak today about art AI reconstruction of musical pieces. And a little bit is, uh, uh, this is a little bit akin to what we have to do. We do a very incomplete measurement. and We try out of that to get the best possible image reconstructed that we can. And one thing we can use to make it a little bit better is, uh, I'll show this again here, is uh, the rotation of the Earth. The 
Earth rotates, of course, so the, the, the uh, objects on the sky stay relatively fixed. And by using that the telescopes on the Earth are actually moving, we create a much more complete um, set of measurements than we would have just in a snapshot observations. This is called for uh, um, aperture synthesis. We synthesize a large aperture by using the Earth rotation. So it gets that place into our hands and makes it a little bit easier to then reconstruct the image as this on the right is, is the earlier one on M87. I'll skip this because we're running a little bit late and I talk about the, uh, what it took to act or how we actually approach making the image uh, of the center of our galaxy that we showed a few weeks ago. I just said it plays into our hands that these telescopes rotate on Earth and so we can take our time and sample the data and, and have a a better, a more complete data set for the image reconstruction. But nature isn't quite as kind to us because it turns out um, in our own galaxy, if you look at this band that you see on vacation in the south, uh, we have a lot of dust in, in between us and the center. So we have the, Im the, the effect that the light that comes from the central region is actually blurred by what we call interstellar scattering. We have a like, a like a milky piece of glass in between us and the object. And the object itself, the, the uh, system ar uh, uh, around the black hole, is comparatively small, it's rotating, and it is variable. This image shows you what you actually see. This is in the, the uh, infrared taken with a, the Keck telescope in Hawaii. This shows what actually you would see near the center of our galaxies variability. These objects flicker. And so we couldn't just go and take a static image of something that doesn't change. We had to take a static image, an image of something that changes and changes uh, on timescales of minutes to hours. Uh, that made, I'll skip this, that made the um, approach to reconstructing the image that we had previously used. We had developed new methods uh, for, for M87 and uh, compared these method methods with artificial data. We knew very well that the structure of this ring that we got, in fact, was the most likely, the most plausible reconstruction. In this case, we had to develop even further methods. That's why it took us a number of years mo more. And we were only uh, done a few months ago, a few months ago, and published a few weeks ago, what we had to do was take snapshots of these images. And here you see what happened. Thousands of different reconstructions of the structure from the data were derived. All of these many, many little pictures fit the data. Um, in image reconstruction, um, we have, uh, for the insiders, we have a fairly simple problem. We need to uh, reconstruct the Fourier transform of our observed data and correct it for, for, say, image defects, measurement defects. Um, all these, I'll show this again, all these images actually fit the data, so any single one of them you could say uh, um, is the final image. What there were are subsets of data and subsets of data take, uh, reconstructed with different methods. And averaging all these, uh, the image that we actually use as the final image is the average of all of these. And you see, just by, by seeing this fly by, many, most of them have this ring-like structure with substructure in between that changes. But these features here that we see in the final thing are the prevailing features. So we are convinced that the average of all these many, many pictures uh, tell us, A, yes, indeed, there is prevailing again and again an, a ring structure, even though in some cases this looks nothing like a ring, and the ring structure has a characteristic uh, diameter, the, the, the diameter of the ring is characteristic, can be derived from that. And this is, so the final average image, and this is four subsets of images that um, have, have particular types of common features. And here is the ones in a few, in a small number of cases, we cannot say this is a reconstructed, uh, this is a ring structure, but this would more be like a potato-shaped uh, funny thing. Nonetheless, we believe that taken this technique, and it also then shows you the beginning of where we need to go next. We need to improve our capabilities to actually get uh, these types of, image of, of images absolutely reliable 
uh, without the last, the latest, uh, the, the residual doubts on that we get the right thing. This is how we approach the reconstruction method. Um, we measure this diameter, and it turns out that uh, the parameters for most, the diameter of this object, are exactly the dimensions that uh, Reinhard Gensler and his colleagues, from measuring the mass at the center of the galaxy, will derive for what the likeness of a uh, gravitationally lensed of the shadow of the black hole near the uh, 4.1 million solar uh, central mass would be. Um, so we can compare two totally different methods in this case, looking at stars thousands, uh, several hundred times further away than the central structures we look, uh, we look at, and we get a perfect match. And this match between the optical infrared and the radio results is what leads us to make a, um, an important conclusion. We believe this confirms, the, uh, this very much confirms and, uh, the prediction that indeed what we have here is a system that can be described by Einstein's predictions for what a, black hole, a supermassive black hole would be. We take this as evidence, the, the match of the size, that alternative models, uh, models alternative to black holes, probably are not uh, realistic for this situation. We cannot give final proof. Uh, it's impossible for the black hole to get to it and prove its existence, um, but we can, uh, with high likeliness, uh, conclude that the, the different approaches hang together. I will maybe say a few words later, if you like, but I will conclude uh, at this point with uh, taking us back to what, what I had at the beginning. We have the web, or scientists on Earth have the Webb Space Telescope for infrared observations, which opens a new window uh, at understanding the universe. We have had a few years ago the first detection of gravitational waves, also something that Einstein predicted. We have uh, the measurements of the stars leading to the prediction of black holes, and we have now our work in the radio making images of these things. So at the end of the day, you find us 100 years after Einstein did his work, 100 years after Eddington set out to prove the theory, hundreds of people more, many billions of euros more, the theory of one man still holds for the description of the fundamental processes in the universe. Um, I want to acknowledge all the people we work with, and I will end with, since you all, many of you are scientists, you know that the, the ultimate for the scientists is to publish their result. This is the papers, six of the ten papers that we managed to publish simultaneously on the 12th of May. Um, hundreds of authors, hundreds of pages, all condensed to one image. Um, that is an average of many, and that has some questions with it. So that's how modern fundamental science goes. We, again, didn't think, or we don't do this for, for recognition particularly, but uh, and also we didn't expect, certainly not in 2019, the interest in the world that this would take. And um, I'm proud of this. Germans will know what that is. But I was astonished when the day after our press conferences around the world, thousands of newspapers take this very one simple, not so many pixel image as evidence for one small step for people to get forward in our understanding of the world. I think that matters. I think that matters for the public. They finance this, and I thank you for your interest in this work. Yeah, thank you very much for this inspiring talk and these amazing insights, how these pictures have been created. So we have now time for questions. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So they have, uh, I will then bring the microphone such that everybody can hear them. There's one over there. So thanks for the interesting talk. Um, question, since you're using the Earth as a telescope, it's a fairly large telescope, or possibly even satellites, is that a simple 2D image, or do you have 3D features in that image as well, since you're coming from slightly different angles at the target? Uh, this is a 2D image reconstruction, but in, in what we can actually do, we, we can use the properties of, um, there's, I didn't mention this, 
polarized properties of the objects and we can make, uh, measure the spectral um, changes uh, that can actually give us also an, a notion of the depth. In this reconstruction, we talk about a two-dimensional uh, image that we made. But the models, which I actually didn't mention, we make, um, let me just take, take a second for that. Um, I, I describe how we make the images. Uh, and, I, and I said very simply, the evidence here is we compare these with the results of uh, the colleagues that I mentioned. Now, what we actually did is uh, we wrote hundreds of pages of theoretical analysis of this work. And the base, uh, there's two lines of thinking there. One is the uh, astrophysical modeling for the system, black hole, accretion disk, and jet that we observe. And so there, what we use uh, is, or what we do is uh, GR, MHD, uh, uh, um, relativistically corrected uh, magnetohydrodynamic modeling, which is three-dimensional uh, by, by nature, to uh, match the results that we, the parameters that we can extract beyond uh, the diameter from the image uh, to the predictions of those, of those models. So there we have a very good understanding of what the three-dimensional uh, system might look like. The other uh, theoretical line is the, the comparison of the results with, uh, with the predictions, with, with the detailed predictions of theory uh, with a view towards, and only experts will understand, uh, towards understanding is the metric of a rotating uh, charged black hole, right, or are alternative metrics necessary? So we do a whole lot more than this simple comparison. Are there further questions? Maybe also from, from Slack, from our remote viewers? So one question um, from Slack is the following. On the image of the Hawaii telescope, one star was blinking rather extremely. What is the effect behind this? Uh, the effect is the, it, it's not really known. It's not precisely understood what the various sources of the, of the variability are. We, see, we have a system where in, in this accretion disk there's probably cloudy, uh, uh, cloudy regions, it's not homogeneous, that rotate at large speed around the center and these, um, these effects of the rotation may cause the um, the uh, effect of the variability. What we see in an individual star, or if what we see is an individual star, or a gaseous cloud, is not clear in all cases. So some of these stars uh, are measured and over a long period of time, and, and you know that they are stars. They are not hugely variable, but the overall system around the center of the galaxy varies dramatically. Do you have further questions? Yeah, so first of all, thanks very much for the, for the talk. Um, at the end, you said there were like hundreds of people working on this together. Can you kind of like give, give like a, just a rough estimate, like how many pieces of work went into, you know, over the years into creating this image? Because I think that's something uh, pretty amazing that so many people work together. I, mean, I think it's pretty hard, but you know, do you have any rough estimate? Um, there, we, 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 um, we built this collaboration and we formed a scientific collaboration and that's the, more, that's the, that's the, the scientists, many of them uh, early career scientists that come into the project, work with uh, a group leader like myself and get a piece of the action. So they get to do a job uh, either in, um, in taking the data, in doing the data analysis at the various stages that we have, or in contributing to the, scientific, to the uh, theoretical interpretation. So there's lots of, uh, of graduate students and uh, junior, senior scientists that came together. But to do this, to make this work, you have all these observatories to actually do their thing. And so at, a, at an observatory, typically you have 30 to 50 people keeping this thing going at the South Pole. Um, not my colleagues, but uh, our colleagues from Arizona which, who operate the South Pole Telescope, graduate students foremost had to go to the South Pole into the uh, South Polar winter, we observe in, in, in April, um, and take the data in pretty adverse conditions uh, with a little 
to do, but they had stints of six months there. They had to wait through the winter time before they could actually send the data disks onto um, uh, uh, flying them out with airplanes to, uh, to the various regions. So many things have to come together. Actually, thousands of people have done a thing as in a space project, have done a thing, have done a small contribution to this larger uh, project. But the actual, um, say, astronomical work, the astronomer like the ones 100 years ago that I showed, going to the telescope, taking their data, massaging them, analyzing them, and publishing them, that's tens to these few hundred people work. So I like to, I like to point out that without do it, having all these people make their contribution and without the pioneers in this technique, which was developed in its infancy 100, uh, 50 years ago, uh, we wouldn't have been able to get to this point. And if you then look at this one 10-meter antenna in space, behind that is a collaboration, another collaboration around the globe centered around a Russian then collaborating organization uh, that sent this antenna out on a, record, uh, on a rocket, uh, on a hugely powerful rocket into orbit, and we, we observed for 10 years with this thing. Again, thousands of people making contributions. In, in this field of astronomy, we are way, way, way away from one man, one woman going up onto the observatory, on the university observatory site and making an image of M87. Okay, we have one more question from here and then a final question, I think, from Zelak. So. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, I saw that you had uh, that you showed a picture of the yeah, the the very process uh, process of from measuring the data to uh, showing the image. Um, and I saw that the middle step was yeah roughly calibrating it. Now calibrating is a rather widespread term, I would say. Yes. So um, can you say us a bit more about what your what what are essentially the uh, the interesting part of the data? Yes, ex uh, exactly. So I guess um, the middle two parts are the where, where I guess uh, you also come uh, to work. So can you, can, you, can you tell us a bit more about these two steps? Yes, so we, um, we digitize the data at the telescope. Um, we sample them. We record uh, uh, 64 uh, gigabit a second of data onto uh, out these uh, tape drives. And so we have two data. In a simple case, now we have eight antennas. Eight antennas gi will give you um, 50, 28 uh, different combinations of two antennas, and these are the data points that we need to get the, the measure, the, the correlated signal from two antennas out these various combinations. So we have to uh, align the two data streams from these two antennas, or all pairs of antennas, to a precision of a quarter of a nanosecond, uh, of 250 nanoseconds, sorry, quarter of a microsecond, uh, typically. And we have to um, we have to align them, pre-align them, and then we make a correlation, a complex correlation of these two data streams, and fit. We we do a fit to the actual precise alignment. Uh, one, th this is this is what we call the phase or the fringe calibration step. We actually have to correct for the path length difference of the um, of the plane wave that comes to these two telescopes and that's affected by all sorts by ins by instrumental effects that we have to need to calibrate but also by atmospheric tropospheric effects uh, so that's the first part the getting the correlated signal the positive correlated signal detected then we have uh, amplitude and phase of a quantity that Fourier transformed will give you an image and there we have the effects of the electronics, there we have the effects of the sensitivity of the array, we have various defects, and so we have all the systematic measurement errors that go into this measurement in addition to the source structure. We want to get the source structure, but we need to compensate, and that's what we call calibrate for the instrumental effects at that stage. And so, again, th that's, that will be the, the, the phase and amplitude calibration, we say, of the signals after we did the calibration. And then the final step uh, that is also prone to, to uh, mistakes or errors is the image reconstruction, which is not a unique thing, but it's an iterative process where, where we use various methods. So these are the different types of things that we have to do. I hope that answers your question better. Okay, so unfortunately, we are at the end of our time box, so if you want further questions, uh, you, we can still talk about them in, in the Slack chat, but uh, to give you all the opportunity to, to move to the other talks, I think we are now at the end, and let's thank our speaker again, and we have also a small present. <laughs>
Thank you very much.